Today, I want to show you some new techniques for planning the composition of the Innsmouth project and maybe giving you some ideas about how to plan your next project. Welcome to another Terranscapes video. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Mike and I will be your host for this video. I'm always the host. I've been doing some studying on composition. Uh, I got a new reference book. I'm going to show it to you briefly uh, for this is for composition of painting, but I think it's completely relevant to me planning the Innsmouth project. And the Innsmouth project is by far the most complicated thing I've ever worked on. Uh, and I really felt like I needed some help in trying to piece together where everything is going to go and what's going to make it effective. So uh, doing a little studying on composition, I felt like it was really helping me and I wanted to share it with you because I thought maybe it might help you as well. So I'm going to go over some of the basics of composition as I have learned them. And then I'm going to show you how I'm applying that to my drafting of the plans for the Innsmouth project. So hopefully you're going to find this instructive. Uh, just before I go to the bench, however, I want to announce that I am going to be moving the cocktails and comments to their own video. Uh, and that video will appear on Fridays. I'm thinking I'm going to call it cocktails and comments. Uh, and the reason I'm moving it is that when I was looking at the survey, very helpful, thank you for everybody who, who did the time to fill that out, uh, about half of you like it on the Tuesday videos, uh, but about 25% of you wish it was on another day. So I think the people who like it on Tuesdays will probably watch it on another day, and that will bring in those other 25% and make them happier. I'm trying to trying to sculpt my channel for you. With that out of the way, let's go to the bench and I'll show you what I've been learning. So my reference for composition is actually this book. This is an old series that was produced by Walter Foster and he had a variety of artists uh, contribute to the series. Look at this price. One dollar. Uh, Tanya, my wife, had a copy uh, in this series of another uh, another topic, and it was uh, given to her by her grandmother, I believe. And it was just I looked at it and I was like, "Wow, it's so great!" Because it's old school, but it's also uh, giving you just the basics. I'm not going to do a review of this book, uh, but I just to give you some sense of you know the. Uh, the types of, of the way it's laid out. What I liked about this is it gives the basics in a really clear way without cluttering uh, my reading time or my mind with lots of uh, fine nuance. So let me give you uh, an overview of what I learned. And hopefully these are things that you can take into your own uh, modeling practice and I'm not an expert in composition, uh, and this is really an overview, but if these are intriguing to you and you want to uh, explore them more, uh, at least this gives you a good foundation to start from. Uh, so the first uh, thing that was explained is this concept of positive and negative spaces uh, and having a variety of shapes of them and distributing the weights to balance. And you know that I've talked about trying to balance uh, visually the weights of things in the past. So this is a concept I had, but hadn't refined in my mind or didn't know how to refine it. So uh, the idea is that you have um, a positive, some element that's either the brightest elements in the piece or they're the darkest on a bright background, and that you have um, varying uh, shapes and you uh, try to weight them. So you're weighting them left to right, but not necessarily top to bottom, which I found very interesting. So if you have a big shape over here, you want like several smaller shapes here. Think of it as, as putting uh, this on a hinge and letting it balance on its own. Um, having a positive area touch the edge of the piece gives a place for the eye to walk into, which I really found that to be intriguing. I'm not able to do this with the project, but it's, it's a great 
sort of foundation of how to encourage the eye to follow a path. Uh, oh, I should add that, yes, this is all for uh, painting, but I think it has a direct relationship to uh, dioramas as well. And you'll see how I incorporate this in just a minute. Another concept is um, activation lines. So this is kind of like connecting pieces with lines that uh, kind of make them visually connected, but not, you know, they're not to be related, but it, it kind of is a sweeping of the eye for the eye's path. At least that's how I interpret it. Uh, and so one example in there was a bunch of sailboats and I just did a little simplified sketch, but you can see how these lines uh, connect to each other. I thought that was very helpful uh, to me as well. And they actually uh, suggest that sometimes people will actually draw in the lines first before they even add anything to the composition, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, but they don't, they, you don't want to direct your eye outside of the piece. So convergence of points should be within the piece. So here, right, we have a convergent point that is still within the composition. Um, here, right, it's still within, uh, you know, and if it looked like these were coming together a little outside, it tends to want to lead the eye outside of the piece, which is something you don't want. So the next point was the concept of having a path for the eye to follow. And you know, I've spoken about that with this project, about how I want to guide people to view it in a certain way. Uh, so in general, we the eye wants to follow from big areas of the positive to the smaller ones um, and down to the dots and the lines. So that is kind of uh, the guideline and, and still you can have more than one path, which I, I think is helpful, especially for me. The other concept in terms of composition to plan for is where the center of focus is going to be. Now, I just mentioned this in the last video about the rule of thirds, how you're off center to make things look interesting. And this refines that idea by marking your composition into four quarters, and then you make one of those the area of focus. So here, right, we have the four areas of focus, and uh, these are aligned through the diagonals of the piece. And then to make the crosshatch, you um, take it as a right angle to this corner from here, right angle to this corner. So that is something that I found really helpful. And you'll see why in, in a few minutes. Uh, well, a couple minutes. Uh, and then the last thing that was interesting to me was the concept of, of what happens when you use three tones, right? So. Here in the positive and the negative, we're really using two tones, something bright, something dark, or vice versa. And here in the three tones, you're adding a, a mid-tone, right? So if, if we were to simplify this and say, you know, these are black, this is white, this would be gray, something in the middle, and you pair it. So you pair a positive and a negative, and then you balance it with the mid-tone, or you can pair them in any way, a negative with the mid-tone, in which case the positive would be the balance or, or vice versa. The mid-tone needs to be larger than the positive, which is uh, interesting and makes sense to me since it has less visual impact. So, and in fact, it said for um, going against um, like dark colors, if that's what you're going to balance against, you need a much larger area of the mid-tone to offset um, dark tones if this is going to be uh, white is your positive and your mid-tone. So um, this idea was helpful because I'm finding that I might want to consider having three major tones in the piece. Now don't make the mistake of thinking that by tone uh, it's implying one color. That's not what it means. So in this piece, we have uh, sort of our positive. We can tell it's the positive because it's um, bright and also small in the area. So your eye is drawn to this. This is sort of where your eye kind of, uh, to me, it enters the piece because you can you jump into the piece, which you can also have uh, as a contrast to walking in from the edge. But uh, you know, we have her hair as being the very strong negative tone uh, 
and I believe these are paired against the um, the mid-tone, which is the rest of the piece. At least that's my interpretation of it, right? So just to give you an idea that it's not a color, it's, a, it's an area of focus that is contrasting with the other areas in the piece. So the first thing I did was that concept of, of quarters and uh, of where to uh, make your, your focus of the piece. And I realized that I actually have two things going on. Um, so I, I have here the normal uh, focus points, uh, considering the piece as a whole. But the piece is really divided into two sections. There's Here's the, the road or the top of the uh, wall, and that means this is all water underneath here. And then this is where the buildings in the background go and the tourist carriage. So I felt like I should maybe consider dividing each of these areas into their own quarters and consider that I may want to have uh, an area of focus for each. So that was kind of like, okay, it gives me some uh, options, another way to view it. So I use this as a template and overlaid my sketches onto this to use that as a bit of a guide. So this is my first uh, sketch, uh, trying to do some of this. And having those paper cutouts was really helpful because I could transpose them roughly onto this piece, using them as a sort of guideline to how many buildings there would be and what might look like a good footprint for them. So that was really helpful. So I laid out, I'm not going to go into some of these early drafts in much detail, but just to say that I was taking a look initially at um, the negatives, the positives, how, how's that working, where are those positives coming from, and then lots of notes about things I should change, you know, moving the dock, um, I move the carriage forward, you know, what might be my third tone, maybe it's the residence, is the water the third tone, that sort of idea. So this is my second uh, uh, draft, and I started to try to think about uh, lines of, of sight and where they're, where they're following and intersecting, and I also started to uh, consider the positives more and where I could add some in, because... I started to realize that I have some balance issues with that. Uh, so... I've been listening to the Innsmouth story again, Shadow of Innsmouth, and taking some notes, lots of notes. And I know that one of the things that he mentioned having to cross is a thorny briar outside the, by the railroad tracks, I believe. And that gave me the idea that if I push apart the buildings, which is nice to break up the, the single line, I could put in some thorny briars in the back, and that could act as a positive because it'll be much brighter. And... Uh, I forgot the fish can act as as you know small positives within the piece, and then it occurred to me I can add some birds, uh, seagulls or pelicans or something like that that would also create like I need a a positive somewhere up high, and one of the other descriptions is that some of the windows were broken and had rags stuffed in them, and that made me think, wait a minute, I could use rags. Uh, to also create a slightly brighter spot because I'm expecting these buildings are going to be very muted. I want the buildings muted. I want the boat muted and and the Innsmouth residence very likely. Those are all going to be very dark tones and then having a deep one, um, having the scientists, having the divers and the, the carriage uh, for the tourists uh, these are the areas where I'm thinking about where do my positives and where do my negatives relate to each other. So I took this and I overlaid um, another piece of paper and I decided to uh, shade in my positives and my negatives and see how that was actually working visually just from a conceptual level. I realized at this point that I could make the boat a negative, uh, which I wanted to do originally. And then, um, you know, seeing where the fish might show up, where the deep one is, uh, the uh, scientists on the dock and, uh, you know, the birds and the carriage, of course, that makes uh, a more balanced piece. In fact, it's more balanced if I enlarge the carriage 
which I actually needed to do because it's not really at a proper scale in my drafts. So after doing all of this, here you see the final draft, uh, and this is my final draft, uh, um, barring me needing to go back after doing some more work and realizing I need to change something. You can see, um, right, that I've, I've done some more refining here, right? He's reaching up, which matches this roof line, which also matches this cross member, and that's kind of a nice line. And this is going to look different in 3D. Uh, so I'm curious to see how this transposes to the 3D mockup, but I wanted to play with those ideas uh, and get a sense for how that might how that might look. Uh, I believe in the story there are birds. I think he mentions them eating dead fish on the shore. So I'm re-listening, but I think I can get away with adding uh, some seagulls uh, scattered about, which will give me some nice uh, bright points to contrast this. I uh, realized that many of the windows should be boarded up. There's cracked glass. One thing was that the uh, community also did a lot of lobstering. And so these are lobster traps. And I did some looking at these online. And boy, you can just stack them up. People just stack those up. So that allows me to add a little bit of height and, and very, you know, put a couple birds on top of that, um, a couple barrels maybe. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to have to push these buildings back a little bit, which actually, when we get to the 3D mock-up down the road, is going to make this look much better from an above view. Another thing I realized is that I wanted some steps coming down. It occurred to me that the dock can't be at the top of the water because if the water was up this high, this would flood very quickly. So uh, I felt justified in having the water come down a little bit lower and that instead of putting stairs in, I could cut the stairs out of the rock wall and have these recessed, which will save me some space on the dock. Uh, the dock is going to be pretty short and I got a lot of things I want to do with it. So that's an issue. And I realized the boat needs to be somehow relevantly connected to the wall and um, adding stairs to come down to that uh, will make a little bit of sense as well. And for the deep one, I've sort of modified my idea to have him climbing uh, over the rock outcropping a little bit, peeking around the edge at the divers. And uh, I will have a second diver. Not exactly sure where he's going to go. Oh, these represent the strange water creatures that they're collecting. I'm thinking of them as sort of Hmm, a mollusk fish composite, and these are like feeler tentacles coming out the front. Uh, we'll see where that goes down the road. And then I decided to take a look at some steampunk carriages and think about what the hell this is going to look like. I really felt lost with that, and I needed to get some ideas, and I found a great one that um, and several photos of various carriages which were fantastic in guiding me a little bit and I was worried I wouldn't have enough space to have uh, multiple tourists I'd like to have five uh, that's a typical ratio in like Jules Verne's books uh, he would have five adventurers usually with only one woman I'd like to have two couples and maybe a single individual or something like that steampunk mechanisms and then this is a little interior coach for a little bit of a uh, more comfortable riding perhaps but this does not need to be fancy this is a tourist van bus whatever and so it doesn't need to be fancy uh, to to work well, but uh, I thought it sh be, should have some little, you know, sunshade for the uh, riders, a little sunshade for the, the driver, and of course this is going to get um, a lot of extensive planning before I actually build because I don't want to just start slapping things together for this. I need to really know the vision of what I'm building to get through that. So there are the plans as they currently stand. Now I will be going back to the 3D model and starting to incorporate some of these concepts. I won't be building new, new buildings. I'll be using the ones I have, but, but putting in the, some fish and the, the boat and the, and the pier, putting this all together and starting to see how it looks from a different angle and how that affects the, 
view as it relates to composition because this is, you know, a two-dimensional straight-on view. I don't really know how that's going to look when I come at it from more of, an, more of a top view down. So we'll see once the 3D model is made up. So I hope you found that informative. I know it's shaped the way I'm thinking about planning a lot and I see it being applicable to a wide variety of projects. So uh, hopefully you learned something from that and that uh, it helps you down the road. So while I've been doing this drafting, I stopped working on the 3D mock-up uh, because I felt like I needed to see more before I started putting more elements onto it, like the diver and fish. I was like, I, sh I should put in the fish in the mock-up too. So uh, that will be what I'll be working on uh, for next Tuesday. Uh, and I think this is going to be really helpful for that. But I'm also very curious to see how that plays out from a a 3D, uh, 3D perspective. It's always a 3D perspective uh, from a, a different viewing angle because I can't see how that's going to look from a top down or a, you know, 60 degree angle or whatever that is. So I'm curious to start playing with that. If you like these videos and you want to support the channel or support the project itself, uh, you can make a small monthly pledge through Patreon, or you could make a one-time donation using the uh, PayPal link that's in the description and any support helps. And I almost forgot I am on Instagram now. Ah. Uh, I'm putting up pictures maybe once or twice a week, I'm kind of playing with it, getting a feel for it. Uh, so if you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle, I think it's called, is uh, Terranscapes. And I'm not responding to comments at the moment. I am reading them and I really enjoy them, but I'm trying to not devote too much time to it. And in general, I haven't been very social on social media. This is the only thing I'm doing right now, so I don't have a Twitter page or a Facebook page. If you ask about those, don't bother. Uh, but I was on Twitter very, very briefly, briefly, very, very briefly, and I was like, ah, I got to get out of this. So maybe I'm just too old. But I'm finding Instagram to be very manageable and kind of a fun way to share a little extra really quickly. So anyway... Follow me there if that sounds interesting. So I hope you'll come back and join me for the work I do on the 3D model, which is on the shelves there, because you know that I will be back soon with another Terranscapes video.